a somewhat precautious philosopher, I think it was Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, once remarked that there were many things in heaven and earth our scientific textbooks know not of. If this simple-minded person, who didn't have his wits about one, as is well known, had sneered at our scientific textbooks, we can confidently reassure him our textbooks contain a lot of things instead that neither exist in heaven nor on earth. This is a diagram of fractional reserve banking or money creation ex nihilo as it is found in many textbooks on economy or banking. This diagram is meant to show that commercial banks can create a multiple amount of money with deposits of their clients. The amount of created money depends on the reserve that each bank keeps from deposits, with a fractional reserve of 10% up to 900 monetary units of so-called book money are assumed to be created. The diagram is pretty abstract and neglects a few facts that should be taken into consideration. The term money creation suggests in this example that money and credit were identical. So let's have a new look at this diagram by introducing the neglected facts and above all by clearly distinguishing money and credit. Money can be used in two ways, either as a medium of exchange in order to buy goods and services, which is the main purpose of money, or it can be used for saving. In case of saving money, it would be sensible to deposit it in the savings account of a bank. The bank will then grant loans to borrowers on interest. Loans have to be repaid according to a contractual period of time. Only after repayment, money can be used again for buying. The immediate exchangeability of money for goods and services is also called liquidity. Only at the date of maturity, credits will be transformed into liquidity again. Let's have a look at the situation from a different angle with emphasis on the function of money. Money, the orange arrow, is always handed over in exchange for goods or services, the green arrows. And with every change of hands, the turnover increases. The complete turnover is measured with the price standard of money. One participant in the circle wants to save the income and puts the money on an account at the bank. If it remained there, the exchange of goods and services would come to a halt. The economy might run into a recession. But another participant in the circle asks the bank for a loan and the exchange of goods and services goes on. As long as credits exist, they appear as static asset and debt entries in bank accounts. They vanish after the borrower has repaid his debt. The granting of credits does not increase the turnover, because no exchange of goods or services is associated with it. Now the credit procedure is reversed. The debtor has earned the amount of his debt and repays it to the bank. The bank then meets the depositor's request for withdrawing the money by handing it over to the client. And again, the exchange of goods and services goes on. Credits are an important tool for saving and at the same time keeping the economy running without gaps in the supply and demand cycle. In conclusion, we can say credit is no money. The creditor doesn't have the money he has lent it and cannot use it before the maturity date. The bank doesn't have the money because it has granted a loan to somebody. The borrower doesn't have the money because he spent it for something needed. He has to re-earn it in order to repay it in due time. Let's turn to our example again. The bank accounts we are talking about here are current accounts. Actually, these do not serve the purpose of saving. They are a convenience for cashless payments or transfers from one account to another. Bank clients can withdraw their money from the current account any day without prior notice to the bank. But most clients leave their money longer there and with transfers from one account to another 
the money remains within the banking sector. Thus, the deposits on current accounts constitute a certain credit potential for short-term credits, which are employed to optimize the usage of money. And that is exactly what's happening in current accounts. Here comes a client who deposits 100 monetary units in Bank A. We don't know how long he keeps it there, whether it will be used for cashless payment or transfer to another account. Another client comes who asks for a loan. He is offered 90 monetary units as loan, while the bank keeps 10 monetary units as reserve in its safe. The money is handed over to the client and the client does not go to Bank B in order to deposit it there. This wouldn't make sense. But he uses the money for what it is meant. He buys something that he needs. Money and goods are now changing hands. The merchant deposits his income of 90 monetary units on a current account in Bank B. Again a client comes and asks for a loan. Bank B keeps 10% of the amount as reserve in its safe and gives 81 monetary units as a loan to the second client. He too wants to buy something and again money and goods are changing hands. The second merchant deposits his income in Bank C and this procedure could go on and on until nearly 900 monetary units of credits had been granted by a number of subsequent banks. Now let's have a look at the whole situation again. The original deposit of 100 monetary units still can be found in the banking system as reserves in Bank A and B plus the deposit in Bank C, the orange figures. Adding these up it results in exactly the original amount of 100 monetary units and not a single cent of money had been created. The additional figures in the bank accounts are credits, that is, no money. The green figures on the left side of the bank account are outstanding claims for repayment from borrowers and the blue figures are assets of the depositors. On savings accounts, the freezed money of assets can only be disposed of after the borrower has repaid the credit amount. On maturity date, the freezed monetary asset is transformed into liquidity again. It's a little different in current accounts because the depositor can withdraw his money at any time he chooses. If the depositor of bank A wants his money back before the borrower has repaid his debt to the bank, the bank would have to borrow the money itself at the interbanking money market in order to meet the client's demand. In case the interbanking money market cannot provide the credit, the bank would have to ask the lender of last resort, the central bank, and the bank would get the needed money there. In the end we can conclude that the so-called money creation by commercial banks is a mere fancy. The figures on bank accounts reflect besides deposited money, which can be used for purchasing, only credits with their two sides of assets and debts, and these cannot be used for purchasing. Fractional reserve banking does not create money, but is just a useful tool for optimizing the usage of supplied money by the central bank and fosters the unhampered flow of money. The confusion arises from a lack of clearly differentiating between money and credit and their different functions. Actually, money is only that which central banks refer to as monetary base. According to nowadays practice of central banks, money comes into existence through credits. That means it stands for values that not yet exist. This practice should be thoroughly questioned because it is not in accord with the market reality and confuses the different functions of money and credit. Besides, the price standard is vulnerable to manipulation.